Chapter 10 Qantas Flight QF-47 rumbled along the runway, air brakes up, wing flaps down, and no doubt a lot of switch flicking going on in the cockpit. I was in the rear section, asleep. I was sitting alone next to the window. I lifted the blind and was blind. The light is so harsh in Queensland. I'd made it somehow. Only two days before, I'd been weeping pitifully in the arms of Craig. Now I was lifting my bag from beneath my feet. This is Wanda, saying we hope you had a pleasant flight and that you'll fly with Qantas again in the near future. Please remain in your seats until the captain has switched off the seatbelt sign. I got through the customs with no problem. I was sure I was going to be arrested because the year before, I'd been given a speeding ticket at Kangaroo Creek, New South Wales, and I'd sort of forgotten to pay it. Judy met me in the airport and we drove to her favourite air-conditioned Italian coffee house in Brisbane. We had both been very busy all year. She was getting ready to go to Ethiopia to make a film for Channel 4 and I was going to America. Forever. We both felt our time together in Australia was precious. It might be the last time we were together for ages. After two days, the phone started going. Hi Robert, this is Mark Eivner, said a voice so beautifully controlled it was hard to believe it wasn't computer generated. Mark Eivner sounded like Hal, the computer, in 2001. No matter what was going on, he would always talk in the same lilting, soothing, west coast accent. I'm the attorney dealing with your work permit. Do you have a moment to talk? A moment? I had all day. I had an attorney. I couldn't believe it. I could picture him in his L.A. law type office. The handmade suit, the Lamborghini in the underground garage. The huge house with the walk around kitchen and the beautiful wife who did a lot of charity work. We'd all seen this man portrayed a thousand times in a thousand movies and TV shows. Mark Ivner, attorney, played by Kevin Costner. He gets the foreign actor the work permit, but then the actor moves into his life, his wife, his nightmares. Visiting performer, starring Kevin Costner, Michelle Pfeiffer, and introducing as the deranged madman, Robert Llewellyn. Mark Eivner explained to me what was happening. Getting you a work permit in the allotted time is going to prove quite challenging. You will have to send me as much information about yourself as you possibly can. I was sitting in a suburban house outside Brisbane, 12,000 miles from my flat in London. All I had with me was my little computer, a pair of shorts, and some broken dark glasses. He wasn't kidding about it being difficult, but I don't know if he understood just how difficult. Many Americans' grasp of geography outside their own borders is hazy at best, and sometimes astonishingly inaccurate. For all I knew, Mark Ivner thought that as people spoke English in Australia, Australia must be near England. Or he may have thought I was Australian. Or he may have thought I was a complete idiot. With copious use of the phone, I managed to get friends in London to go to my flat, find my cuttings file, which was a bit of a joke. It wasn't a file, it was a box full of old bits of newspapers and magazines. They then had to send these by expensive courier to Los Angeles as soon as possible. Then the phone started to ring again. It was Linwood Boomer. Hi, Robert, this is Linwood speaking. Listen, uh, Robin Dog, tell me you're still not sure about doing the pilot. I'd like to hear why you're having this problem, Robert. Maybe we can work something out together. Yes, that'd be good, I said. I tried to explain my misgivings. Well, it's, it's kind of a heavy commitment. I was referring to a section in the contract which dealt with how long I was under the control of Universal Television. Basically, it was six years. They wanted me to sign something that could mean I may have to live and work in Los Angeles for six years. Six years seems like a long time to me, I said. You know, in England, we sign a contract for six weeks and we think we're going to miss a better gig. Sure, I understand, said Linwood. But, you know, that part is a deal breaker. That was the term, deal breaker. That meant you could negotiate everything else. You could get a bigger limo. You could get a different makeup artist. You could get much more money. That was easy. But sign for shorter than six years? No way. When people buy you in Hollywood, Robert, they really do buy your ass, said Linwood jokingly. I thought that's the sort of humour that scares the shit out of me. I'll think about it and get back to you, I said, and Linwood impressed on me the fact that getting back to him very soon would be very beneficial for the project, the people behind the project, and quite a sizable proportion of the population of Southern California. I had been worrying about the six-year part of the deal ever since my agent first informed me a few weeks earlier. I spent a couple of hours on the phone to Nigel Planer, who I'd been working with earlier in the year. 
He was the only person I knew who'd been through the same thing. The Young Ones was taken over the Atlantic in the mid-80s, and Nigel was the only member of the British cast to go. He had experienced a fairly hideous time. Worried sick that he was going to have to stay there for six years with a group of people he hated who managed to make the Young Ones into a sort of grubby Benny Hill show. He was hugely relieved when the pilot was a flop and he was released from his contract. I took it as a salutary warning. It was not going to be an easy thing to decide. I'd been through a similar experience on a lower level many years before, when I was still working with the comedy group The Joeys. A BBC director had seen a show we were doing and asked me to go along to read for a part he was casting. I had no experience at that time. I had no agent. I didn't know the first thing about the BBC. I went along and met the writer, a charming man called Howard Schumann, who wrote The Rock Follies back in the early 70s. They wanted me to play quite a large role, well, looking back, I suppose it was the lead, in a new BBC drama set in a pirate TV station. To cut a long story short, I eventually said no. It was interrupting the work I loved with the Joeys. It was upsetting the group dynamics within the company. That's another way of saying we were dealing with professional jealousy in a mature and giving way. In fact, more importantly, I got the impression that the people behind the play just naturally assumed I'd jump at the part, like all actors would. Saying no was very hard. I felt physically sick afterwards, and I regret not working with Howard Schumann, because I think he's good. But I was always glad I said no. Now I was faced with a similar decision, only on a much bigger scale. Mind you, as I kept reminding myself, what a decision to have to make. Do I go to Los Angeles and get paid quite stupendous amounts of money doing a job I already do in England? I live in a fabulous house in the hills, drive a Ford Mustang convertible to work every day, or do I go back to the rain and cold of recession hit Britain? Or alternatively, do I work in Los Angeles, probably get mugged, maybe get shot, go to an analyst every day, get ripped off, become a gym junkie, use steroids, pump up and turn into a sad sub Claude Van Damme gym junkie and die of a heart attack while wearing a rubber head at the age of 40? Or go and live on a farm in Gloucestershire with a couple of pigs and a dog and live till I'm 97? Back in Brisbane, Judy and I went Christmas shopping. This was to be my first Christmas in Australia, and Christmas lunch was going to be out in the yard, not on the beach. But I wasn't complaining. Judy's departure to Ethiopia was looming. I was still sweating buckets trying to decide what to do. We went to a seafront hotel in Yamba for a week. Yamba is a very quiet coastal town about 400 miles south of Brisbane in northern New South Wales. Judy's brother and wife were there on holiday. We spent three days lounging around on the beach, going for walks along the riverbank, watching pelicans and dolphins. It was so new and clean and tidy. Our hire car was quiet and modern and clean. The sea was clean. The shops were clean. It was just like home and away. Then on the morning of the fourth day, at about 5.30 in the morning to be exact, the phone rang. The voice of the motel proprietor came on. A call for you from Los Angeles, he said in his home and away type accent. Hi Robert, this is Linwood, how's it going? Said the super clear voice on the phone. For a moment I thought, God, he's come to Australia to get me. He's in Yamba with a gun. Okay Linwood, I said trying to wake up. I, I suppose you want me to tell you my decision. Sure Robert, that would be real good. I moaned at Linwood how I was worried about living in Los Angeles, about being apart from Judy and my friends. I don't think you understand, Robert, Linwood explained patiently. You're going to be very rich. If this series takes off, you more or less write your own ticket. You can pay for your friends to come visit. You can buy Judy a house in the hills to keep her happy. This is Hollywood, Robert. Stuff happens here. Yeah, but six years, I said feebly. Six years, nothing. Do you know how much Ted Danson gets in Cheers? Yeah, but I'm never going to be Ted Danson, I said. That's not the point. This is just to give you some idea of what you could get if the show is a hit. Ted Danson gets over $1 million an episode. He does 36 shows a year, Robert. You are looking at the prospect of earning some serious money here. Not only that, he continued with barely a breath, I know you're really going to get on with the team we've got here. Some really great actors, really nice people who I know you're going to bond with. What it all adds up to, Robert, is being paid a heck of a lot of money for having a heck of a great time. Really, you should do it. I have to ask the woman I love, I said, surprising myself at the expression. 
the woman I love rolled over in bed, looked at her watch and said, Ah, oh, sign the fucking contract so I can get some sleep. I'll do it, I said to Linwood. You won't regret it. I'll get my people onto it straight away. We're going to fly you here first class. You'll get a limo at the airport. You will not know what's hit you. It's going to be great, Robert. Believe me. I was, I have to say, starting to believe him. I went out on our home and away sun porch, breathed the salty air deeply and felt tingly all over. The sun was just coming up. I watched a dolphin surface behind a fishing boat that was chugging slowly into the harbour. The air was still cool and fresh, but with that special sea tang. It was drop-dead beautiful as I stared out to sea. It was across this ocean that I was going to go and change my life become an American TV star, wear a rubber mask until I was 41, earn hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Be rich. Later that day, Judy and I walked along the 10-mile beach, which stretches south from Yamba. The sun was beating down, but the wind kept us cool. I stood with my feet in the Pacific and said the word rich over and over again. I'd never been rich. I'd earn money, sometimes more than the national average, but for the vast majority of my adult life, I had lived on virtually nothing. Truly subsistence living. Now suddenly, in my mid-thirties, I was going to be earning huge amounts of money. I was going to be living in a foreign country, and everything I was used to was going to disappear. I knew what real rich people were like. People with old money, seriously rich people, don't appear in TV sitcoms. They don't appear at all. They live in old houses in the home counties and they shoot things, pheasants mainly. Seriously rich people earn millions of pounds a year doing nothing because they've got billions of pounds in the bank. I struggled to get my potential richness in perspective. Christmas in Brisbane was a wonderful family affair. All Judy's brothers and their wives and children, friends and relatives, rallies, sat under the house out of the blazing sun. We had a surprisingly traditional English Christmas dinner only cold with salad. We had Christmas pud and mince pies and there was loads of washing up to do. It was brilliant. On New Year's Eve, I flew to Melbourne and Judy flew to London to meet up with her film crew before flying to Ethiopia. I spent New Year's Eve with hundreds of Judy's friends in a warehouse party in Melbourne. It was great, actually. She spent it in a plane waiting on the tarmac at Singapore Airport. I spent 10 days in Melbourne waiting for my work permit to come through. It rained every day. I heard on the radio one morning. This is the wettest 10-day period in January since records began back in 1850. My suntan peeled off. It was like going back to London. In fact, Melbourne is very like London. It's like Streatham, to be accurate. Presumably built at about the same time. The one thing Melbourne has over Streatham, though, is trams. Old green rattling things, which can take you all over the city for about 50 pence. They're brilliant and remind all English people who visit just what a good idea trams are and how stupid we were to allow the car manufacturers to destroy them. The subtext in that sentence is worth investigating. On January the 8th, I caught the number 35 tram down the St Kilda Road, got off outside the American consulate building and picked up my passport. I turned the page and saw what had taken such a struggle to get. An H1 visa allowing me to work in the United States for a period of six months from the 10th of January. On my last night, I went out for a Vietnamese meal with all the friends I'd made in Melbourne. Early the following morning, my mate Wayne took me out to the airport in his battered Honda. It was a great way to start a journey to immense, undreamed-of wealth. Sitting in the ripped seat of a rust bucket car with my bag stuffed on top of a kiddie seat in the back. I got to the airport about half an hour before the flight. I had a first class ticket waiting for me. You don't have to hang around when you're on first class. I didn't know how rich people lived, but I was prepared to learn. A nicely dressed young man carried my one small bag to the plane for me. I only had to carry my ticket. I was shown to a huge leather seat right up in the nose bit. It was like an armchair. I sat down and was offered champagne. I don't normally drink, but this was just too much. How could I refuse? Before I got over the bubble effect of the champagne, the plane started to move. This is the life, I thought. Get on the plane, plane flies. No hanging around watching people try and stuff too much hand luggage into the overhead compartment. I also discovered why they put the first class compartment up at the front of the plane. It's about ten times smoother than the back where I normally had to sit. 
you can barely feel the plane moving. Then I discovered my toiletries bag. You may be able to tell from this that I love flying, which I do, but this was the best. A little leather toiletries bag. I've still got it. It was full of the best gentleman's bits and bobs on offer. Aftershave, face cream, mouthwash, toothpaste, toothbrush. Not a little fold-up throw-away one. A proper posh toothbrush. Nice pongy soap, a little flannel, a plastic thing for getting the fluff off your clothes. I was in heaven. Then they bought the food. Oh boy. I mean, I love airline food when it's on a little tray with little plastic pots and salt and pepper in a paper tube. But the first class food, I couldn't believe it. Dead posh and really nice. What's more, I could help myself to the trolley. This is my big problem with being in posh places. Being served by people makes me uncomfortable. I like serving people or doing things myself. Really, when I was sitting in the first class compartment, it was as if Crichton was there, dithering and offering to wash up. There were only two people in the first class compartment, me and an orthodontist from Beverly Hills who'd been visiting his daughter in Sydney. He told me I had potentially great teeth, but that if I went to see him, he could give me star quality teeth. I said I didn't like perfect white teeth, I thought they looked fake. He said he would hand sculpt my teeth so they would look perfectly natural and naturally perfect. The orthodontist and I had three members of the cabin crew to look after us, so they weren't exactly stretched. The nice thing about Australians is they didn't give me a second look. They were quite happy to let this scruffy oik help himself to the boeuf de la ladida avec les veges et all les trimmings. I had the time of my life, but as I normally don't drink, I was soon flat on my back, grinning and dribbling slightly, sleeping in my super comfortable great big lift your feet up leather chair. I was so happy I'd said yes to Linwood Boomer. I could see him in my dreams, waiting by a big door with the word Hollywood written on it. He was always about to open it in the dream and let me see what was there, but he never quite did. The plane landed in Los Angeles two and a half hours before it had taken off in Melbourne. I started the journey at 12.30 in the afternoon in Melbourne. I arrived in Los Angeles at 10.30 in the morning of the same day. I'd flown across the international dateline and I'd been flying for 18 hours. I stood in the immigration queue scratching my head with that special expression which only happens to people when their internal body clock has completely blown a fuse. No amount of watch gazing or mental mathematics can alleviate the hollow burned out feeling you get after a real long haul flight. I love that feeling, it's better than taking drugs. I was completely out of it as I handed the immigration official my passport. He looked at my work permit, looked at me, looked at my work permit again, smiled slightly and said, Welcome to the USA, sir. Thank you, I said. You're welcome, he said. And I knew I'd arrived. As I walked out into the main concourse, there were about 300 limousine drivers standing behind the barrier, each of them with a card bearing someone's name. I scanned the cards. Nothing which looked anything like Llewellyn. I was prepared for something akin to Llewellyn, like Lou Elaine or Lou Ellen. My name has been spelt many different ways over the years, but there was nothing even remotely like it. A huge black policewoman with a massive gun was standing with them. She looked at me and registered my anxiety. She didn't offer to help, just let her hand brush the butt of her gun as she adjusted her belt. I walked past the throng of people waiting for passengers and sat on a seat in the waiting area. The shock of America is always pretty intense. It operates on a higher level than any other country I've visited. Anything can happen in America. You can make it. If it seems hopeless in Europe or Africa or Asia, when you arrive in America, you know immediately it could be possible. That's why so many people want to go there. They've heard this is what it's like, and it's true. People go to America and they do make it. Some of them become wealthy beyond the dreams of kings. I'm sure if you did a statistical analysis, you'd find out it was very few of them. Most people are really poor, as usual, but the atmosphere is utterly infectious. Even the limousine drivers are happy to be working, happy to serve you, and look like they're about to make it big somewhere. Mr Llewellyn, asked a deep male voice. I looked up into the sun-tanned face with perfect teeth and carved sculpture of super shiny hair on top. Yeah, I said. Hi, I'm John. I'll be your driver at this time. Would you like to follow me? I stood up to discover, although John had a wonderful, deep, smooth American voice, he was a little on the short side. Still, he wasn't letting that hold him back. 
He picked up my bag and started making his way through the crowd. I was on my guard. I've been around. This looked like the oldest trick in the book. Read the label on my luggage, ask me to follow him, then pull a gun on me in the car park, put me in the trunk of the limo, drive out to a desert ranch full of psychopathic killers, nail me to the floor and gang rape me to death over a period of three weeks. I checked my luggage. There was no label on it. John walked to a huge, and I mean huge, joke of a car. It looked six cars long, an absurd long black thing with about 15 tinted windows down the side. It was the cliché. It was the stupid stretch limo, which is so embarrassing now, so out of date. I mean, let's face it, a stretch limo is now, and always was, and always will be, a tosser's car. John popped the trunk, put my bag in, and opened the door for me. I was sleep-starved and feeling so weird that I couldn't help giggling a bit. I almost expected to see Michael Douglas sitting in the back, having a blowjob and buying Rio Tinto zinc like it was going out of style. He'd be wearing a $5,000 suit with his hair slicked back. He'd be Gordon Gecko. Robert, I want you to find out everything you can about Universal Television while you're there. I want to buy them out. I want to suck them dry. Chew the fat out of the motherfuckers. I want to own their goddamn balls. Yes, Mr. Gecko, sir. The limo was empty, huge and lonely looking. Uh, can I sit up the front with you? I asked rather sheepishly. Sure, Bob, said John. No English person could call you Bob that quickly. I slipped into the spacious front seat. John started the huge car up and we hissed along the concrete roads. John had lived in L.A. for 20 years. He seemed to have done everything worked everywhere, and of course, driven everyone. I had Ellen Barkin in here yesterday, he said as we pulled out of the airport onto a huge five-lane freeway. She's a very beautiful lady and very charming. Is that right? Oh, uh, yeah. I've always had a soft spot for Ellen, I said, settling into the huge comfy seat and slipping on my dark glasses. Of course, one of the perks of this job, Bob, is that I get to find out where everyone lives, he said. I could take you to Ellen's house, introduce you maybe. Oh, yeah, I said, suddenly panicking again. He had to be a serial killer. He knew where the stars lived. He kept a little black notebook next to a knife with a jagged edge. I would be the only person who could save Ellen. I'd run to her house, a police helicopter shining a light on me from above. I'd fight John to the death. I'd be injured. She'd visit me in the hospital. The black doctor would say I might pull through. Ellen would cry. We'd kiss. <laughs> Within minutes of being in Los Angeles, I had slipped into movie land. Everywhere I looked seemed so familiar, and although I'd been there on two previous occasions, this familiarity wasn't from past experience. It was from the movies, the thousands of films we've all seen, filmed on the streets of Los Angeles. Tall palm trees, wide roads, absurdly stretched limousines, big black pickup trucks with massive tyres, convertible Rolls Royces with the roof down, bust up old Buick station wagons full of migrant workers wearing blue nylon peak caps. We drove over south central LA at speed. It doesn't look like much. Row after row of red roofed houses, the odd palm tree, and every few miles a massive building with no windows, which is an air conditioned shopping mall. In the far distance, the gleaming, glittering towers of downtown L.A. It is a frightening town. It is a depressing town. It is a town of the most cruel contrast between wealth and poverty. But it is exciting. However jaded and old world and European I try to be, I can't help my pulse rate increasing when I'm there. I felt so vibrant and alive. Maybe it was due to the fact that I'd been through a time warp. But I have very clear memories of the first few hours of each trip to Los Angeles. By now, John had found out all about me. So, what's this series you're making? He asked. Uh, it's not a series, it's only a pilot. It's, it's called Red Dwarf. Red Dwarf. Yes, that's right. Red Dwarf. Yes, it's about a spaceship. So it's not about dwarves? No, no, it's set on a spaceship called Red Dwarf. Three million light years from Earth, going the wrong way. Red Dwarf. Yeah, yeah, that's right. This was a very American phenomenon. There was something about the title that a lot of Americans couldn't quite latch on to. They are terribly verbally politically correct, and using a term like dwarf makes them flinch. It's a bit like us using the term spazzo. It's just not done. If an American actor said to you, I appear in this show called Red Spazzo, you'd blanch a bit, wouldn't you? I would. Red dwarf. John was still stuck on this. Actually, Bob, looking at you, you are perfect for a project I'm working on. This was it, I thought. He was a psychopath. His project was my grisly murder. 
It's a movie about a pool service operative. He goes to all the stars' homes and cleans their pools, and he has sex with all these women. I thought about casting him as French, but I think English would be better. The project is with Ted Rinvalkalats, the guy who did Bunny Killers last year. May I send your agent a script? Sure, I said, and gave him my agent's card. We drove through Hollywood, across the hills, and into the valley. This was the home of Universal Studios, where you can do the Universal Studio tour and see Miami Vice shootouts and Jaws comes to try and eat you. We drove up a steep tree-lined drive and pulled up in front of the Universal Sheraton Hotel. Immediately, there were smartly dressed men opening doors and trunks and palms as I carried my own very small bag into reception. I bid John farewell. He told me to expect his script at any time. I'm still waiting for it. I checked in and got the lift with a huge man in a suit and a very small blonde woman. The woman turned out to be Dolly Parton. She smiled at me. I didn't know what to do. I was tripping with exhaustion. Oh, hi, I said. It's great to meet you. Dolly smiled again. The door opened on the 12th floor and I fell out. My room overlooked a six-lane freeway and a swimming pool fringed with lanky palms. I sat down and calmed down. The January sun was hot through the window. I had to try and stay awake until night time or the jet lag would last weeks, and I was due to start work two days later. I picked up the phone and dialed a very long number, which Judy had faxed to the hotel for me from Ethiopia. Hello? Hello. Can I speak to Judy? Hello. Can I speak to Judy? Pa Hello. Yes. Can I speak to? Hello. This went on for about four minutes until I could hear the phone being thrown down. Then I waited a bit longer, and suddenly there was Judy on the line. She was in Africa. She was having the time of her life. She was okay. Now, if by chance you win the pools or your premium bond comes up and you get depressed because money doesn't bring you happiness and you want to get rid of your money, if you feel like that, here is a good way of getting rid of quite a stupendous amount very, very quickly. Okay, fly to Los Angeles first class, Qantas via Melbourne. That'd use up a fair bit, I would think. Then check into the Universal Sheraton Hotel. From there, call the Hotel Gohar Gondar, Ethiopia, and ask to speak to Len. There won't be anybody there called Len, but they'll go and have a look for you anyway. As they look, you will be paying stupendous amounts of dollars to listen down a phone line to the sound of Africa. But Judy was okay. I was relieved. I fell asleep for what felt like a week. Chapter 11 The following day, I met Andrea. This was really the only thing I insisted on during the prolonged negotiations over my contract. I wanted Andrea to do my makeup. She knew me so well and knew how to look after me. Thankfully, not only did the producers agree, but so did Andrea. She had been travelling with her boyfriend and was going around the world on her much longed for holiday. We met up in the lobby and drove into the valley to a special effects company who were making the new Crichton mask and costume. The company was situated in a large industrial complex, the sort of place Mel Gibson finds a heroin factory and shoots lots of stuntmen. The special effects boys were great, so like their English cousins, enthusiastic and fast-talking, living in a world of in-jokes and technical explanation. We're going to do everything in our power to make sure you are really incredibly comfortable, Robert, said the man with the beard. So first, we need to do a full body cast. In an effort to make me incredibly comfortable, I had to stand and be covered in plaster of Paris bandage again and be incredibly uncomfortable. The glamour of first-class travel and luxury hotel suites was suddenly knocked into focus. I was here to work. I was here to wear rubber, and there was no way of getting around that. I stood still and started to take in the surroundings. This was the company who made Spock's ears, phasers which could be set to stun, the little flip-top box that Captain Kirk asked Scotty to beam him up with. They made the weird wraparound glasses for the black guy in the new Star Trek that I still haven't seen. They made guns and spaceships and all manner of weird bits and pieces for dozens of movies. A man who looked like he was in Easy Rider entered the workshop. He was going to make my new mask. I got very involved in the discussions as to how it should work, how much of my face should be exposed, and if I could keep my own nose. The battle of the mask was to continue for many days, but the man who made my mask, who I only met once, was a real genius and a fast genius. When Andrea and I got back to the hotel that evening, Rob and Doug had turned up, delirious with jet lag. 
They had been working flat out on editing the British series, so they were tired before they even set out. They sat in the lobby of the hotel, drank large schooners of lager, and grinned at everybody. It's amazing, I think, said Rob. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, said Doug. On Monday morning, the cast and crew of Red Dwarf gathered inside the vast studio of Stage 43, Universal City Studios. The space was twice the size of Shepperton, which is big enough. The sight that made us gasp was the set, an exact replica of the British set in every detail. The floor plan was exactly the same, the fittings, everything. It was absolutely remarkable. A man of about six foot seven walked up to me. He looked like an ex-basketball player. He was an ex-basketball player and the stage manager. He shook my hand firmly and introduced himself as Elvin Ivory. He asked me very politely if I would follow him. I did so. I followed his huge long strides outside into the weak morning sun. I'm going to show you your parking space, Robert, he said as if I was an unruly kid at a kindergarten. We walked across a huge parking lot and he stood in an empty space in the middle. This is your parking space. If anyone else parks here, you come and tell me, and I will personally kick their ass. And if you park anyplace else, I will kick your ass. You understand? Yeah, sure, I said, trying to sound local and cool. There's only one problem. What's that? snapped Elvin. I don't have a car. Elvin was silent for a moment. He chewed his lips. Then he said, Robert, I don't give a damn if you have a car or not. This is your space, and if any other motherfucker parks his motherfucking car here, I want you to tell me. You understand? I understand, Elvin, I said. I followed Elvin back to the studio. As we walked down the canyon between the huge buildings, he pointed to a smaller building, which looked like a block of flats. That's your dressing room over there. It's got your name on door, Robert Llewellyn. Elvin clearly didn't like leaving anything to chance. He was to continue to remind me of my name at regular intervals. In the studio, more and more people were gathering, men in suits mingling with scruffy-looking arty types. I was making myself a tea, trying to work out who was who in the cast. At that point, I'd only met Hinton Battle, the actor who was to play the cat. His similarities to Danny were amazing. He was an actor and dancer. He'd been in dozens of Broadway shows. He'd won awards. He'd worked with Diana Ross, with Madonna. A slim man shook my hand. Hi, Robert. I'm Chris Eigman. He had one of those sharp, funny, what I take to be New York intellectual accents. Chris, I discovered, is from Colorado, and he was playing Rimmer. I immediately warmed to him. He looked like an alternative rimmer. Good casting, I thought to myself. I recognised him from a film called Metropolitan, which I'd seen a couple of years earlier, about posh kids in New York, in which he was very funny. Hi, Robert. Welcome to Hollywood. I'm Linwood, said Linwood Boomer. He wasn't short or fat. He didn't wear glasses. He was handsome, athletic-looking and Californian. He shook my hand vigorously. I stared into his unusually bright blue eyes and wondered if his name really, really was Linwood Boomer. I always had a suspicion his name was Pete Jones or something, but a daft Hollywood agent had told him a name like Linwood would get him more gigs. Linwood used to be in an American series called Little House on the Prairie, where he played a blind boy. His eyes are so bright blue it was easy to see how he got the part. You can never quite believe he's actually looking at you. Meet Craig Beerkow, he's playing Lister, said Linwood as he guided me towards a tall, handsome man who I'd taken to be the director or a writer or someone like that. Certainly not Lister. Hi, Bob, he said. Great to work with you. I've watched all the Red Dwarf series. I think you guys do an incredible job. So this was Lister, a tall, handsome white man. When I discussed this with Rob and Doug one evening in their office in Shepperton, they'd been under the impression that Lister was going to be a short, tubby Hispanic actor. That seemed to fit the bill, but clearly the Americans had worried that portraying a Hispanic man as a dirty, lazy, but very humane slob would create a negative reaction in the Hispanic community, or something. In some ways, it's the same Hollywood paranoia behind the fear that middle America wouldn't understand British humour, or a Leverpudlian accent. It's rubbish. If you can understand someone from Mississippi, you can understand anything. The reason American television channels don't show British comedy programmes is because they don't want to. They make their own, and they make a fortune out of it, and they make really good television programmes. Why give money to anyone else? They'd be stupid to do otherwise. All that's clear is it's got nothing to do with accents. When I'd arrived, I'd walked past a very glamorous woman in the car park with a lot of hair. 
Big Hair, as I discovered it was called. She smiled at me, and I felt flattered that someone so good-looking would even notice me. Suddenly, she was standing in front of me, shaking my hand. Hello, Robert. I'm Jane Leaves, she said in a husky English accent. I'm Holly. Jane had lived in Los Angeles for ten years. She was appearing as a regular character in Murphy Brown, a sitcom which gained international notoriety when the lead character, played by Candice Bergman, criticised the vice president, Dan Quayle, during the run-up to the election. It's worth noting here that when I originally wrote this book, Jane Leaves had not started working on Frasier, where she played the British carer of Frasier's dad. I have seen her once since, and all the things Linwood Boomer had originally said about how much money you can earn in an American sitcom have been proved true. Jane Leaves is not a poor woman. My head was spinning with all this new information and the names which I had to try and remember. The three other members of the cast were Lorraine Twisson, who played Captain Tao, Elizabeth Moorhead, who played Kachansky, and Michael Heitzman, who played Officer Munson. Naturally, I managed to get the whole thing utterly confused. The car stood in a small circle, and I said everyone's name and pointed to them. Hinton, Jane, Craig, Chris. I got Craig and Chris the wrong way round. I was so confused about the fact that they had the same names as their English counterparts, my brain had gone on short time, and I decided that the coincidence was too great. It must be Rimmer played by Craig and Lister played by Chris. I'm Chris, that's Craig said Chris Eichmann patiently. He patted me on the back. You're confused, aren't you, Robert? But you're working in Hollywood now, though. It's important you remember everyone's name. I'll be testing you from time to time. People started to sit down around a long table in front of the set. Most people seemed to know where to sit. I couldn't work it out, so I hovered about looking for help. Elvin Ivory noticed this and pointed to a canvas director's chair with my name emblazoned on the back in red applique. Robert Llewellyn, he said as he tapped the chair. I couldn't believe it. I had my own chair with my own name on the back. Like in Hollywood. Except it wasn't like in Hollywood. It actually was in Hollywood. I sat down but kept turning round to look at my name. I showed Rob and Doug, who were sitting down the other end of the table. They stood up and showed me their chairs. They had their own names on theirs too. The only difference being their chairs stood a good five inches higher than mine. There was already a hierarchy. The actors get the low chairs with their names on, the writers, producers and directors all have higher chairs with footrests. Good morning everybody and welcome to Stage 42 Universal City Studios where we are going to make a pilot episode of Red Dwarf, said Linwood. We are all going to have a great time here, this is a fantastic script. It comes from a great series which is a real big hit in Great Britain. We've got a fantastic cast, you guys. He looked along the side of the table we were all sitting. Craig Bierko, Chris Eichmann, Robert Llewellyn, Jane Leaves. There was a huge round of applause from everybody. Rob and Doug joined in, slightly later, but with no less enthusiasm. Linwood continued. A great director, Jeff Field. He looked at a quiet-looking man with a beard who nodded and smiled. He got another round of applause, not quite so big as ours. And a great crew. About 15 assorted people whooped and clapped vigorously. I joined in politely. They got the least of the claps. Well, all right, said Linwood, rising to the occasion. I know we're all going to bond real good and have a really great time, because if we have a great time, we'll produce a great product. And that's why we're here, people, to produce good television. Red Dwarf. Even Linwood said Red Dwarf a bit like John the Limo Driver. Okay, so let's read the script. Then we'll have a talk, get to know each other, and have lunch. My smile was fixed to my face. I told myself quietly, these people are clearly mad. They all clap each other, but we haven't done anything yet. Stay calm. You're only here for three weeks. You haven't actually signed your contract yet. Breathe into the anxiety. I glanced to my right to see Craig Bierko looking healthily depressed. Maybe they're not all mad, I hoped as I picked up my script. As we read, the banks of men in suits sitting in the audience seating laughed very supportively during the funny parts. The director laughed convincingly, but automatically, at every potentially amusing moment. We had to wait every now and then for Linwood Boomer's long, languorous ha <laughs> For the first time in my Red Dwarf experience, though, I was the old-timer. I knew my character backwards. Everyone else was struggling with theirs. As soon as we'd finished reading through the script, the cast gathered around the craft services table. Craft services is catering to you and me. 
At the BBC, this might sometimes stretch to a coffee machine and a pile of plastic cups, sometimes even one packet of biscuits. In Hollywood, there was always a huge table freshly stocked with regular coffee, decaf coffee, 15 different sorts of tea, herbal and regular, Danish pastries, donuts, a massive bowl full of candy bars, bowls of fruit like they have in adverts, chewing gum, bubble gum, lollies, mints, muffins, which are like small Christmas cakes, and a fridge full of every sort of soft drink, fruit juice, cola and mineral water you could possibly imagine. The table sagged under its heavy burden, and as soon as we demolished one pile of food, it was mysteriously replaced by someone from Craft Services. So what do you think of the script, Robert? asked Hinton. I was just about to speak when I realised the whole cast was standing around waiting to hear what I had to say. Oh, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's good. Come on, it's crap, isn't it? said Craig Bieko. Well, it has room for some more gags, I said politely. Like about ten square miles, said Chris Eichmann. Come on, people, let's face it, we got a turkey on our hands. Oh, no, I interjected. It'll be okay. Look, the boys are here. I pointed to Rob and Doug, who were talking to Linwood Boomer and Jeff Field, the director. Which is which? asked Hinton. Rob is the one wearing the weird cowboy boots who's smoking and talking quite a lot. He's sort of harsh and cruel on the outside, but actually I think there's a very caring person trapped inside somewhere. Doug is the one with the limp who is talking less, but listening very carefully. He's more caring and considerate at first glance, but I have the suspicion he is an absolute rock on the inside. It was like a scene from a 30s backstage movie. The cast were all grouped around to hear what I was saying. I was almost expecting Mickey Rooney to walk in at any moment and say, Come on, guys, let's do the show here! We had lunch together in a huge canteen that was miles away on the other side of the lot. To get there, we had to walk through the public part of the studio complex, the Universal Studio Tour section. It was like working backstage in a theme park, because that is essentially where we were. Every ten minutes or so, a tractor pulling 500 people in open-top trailers would rumble past the studio door, and we would hear snippets of studio history. On the left is the studio where, in 1953, Clint Eastwood made his first appearance in... The canteen was not full of movie stars, but every now and then someone would walk past who I recognised from some sitcom or other which had been shown in England. Of course, being proper actors, my fellow cast members knew who everyone was, what they were in now, what they had been in, what they were hoping to be in, how much they got paid, which agency they were in, and which team they batted for. We spent the afternoon blocking out each scene in the most relaxed and happy manner. The whole setup was so calm. As actors, our every whim was catered for. There was absolutely no pressure on us to do anything. Jeff Field, the director, came up to me at one point as I was trying to learn the first couple of speeches I had to do. Uh, Robert, maybe we could go through this opening scene at some point, you know? Oh, sure, 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 I said as I jumped up, my normal reaction from three series of Red Dwarf in England. No, no, there's no rush. You come over whenever you're ready, said Jeff. I was slowly learning that all the hierarchies I was used to did not apply in America. On the set of a British TV programme, the director is boss. Everyone works around them. In America, it's the producer, who is often one of the writers as well. Linwood Boomer was that man. Jeff was just the director and seemed to be more or less at our beck and call. The actors seemed to be the ones in charge. When we'd been over the show once, Linwood showed up and we all went through it again for him. He looked like a worried man when it was over. He looked yet more worried after Chris Eigman and Craig Bieko both had a little word with him, quite rightly, because they thought their characters were being short-changed. I kept quiet, because from where I was standing, Crichton had all the best lines, the best gags and the best routines. The other unexpected bonus was that I knew most of my lines already, because I'd learned most of them before. This was the odd thing about the script. Although it did have Linwood Boomer's name on the cover, I recognised a lot of the lines from the first episode of the British version. I'm not saying that Linwood should have written a completely new show. He wasn't claiming to have done that either. It was an adaptation of the original script. But as seemed to happen so often, it lost some of its original sparkle. The first week was spent very calmly going through the script, blocking out each scene, eating Danish pastries and drinking coffee. At one point, when I was making an entrance into the sleeping quarters, Jeff Field stopped me and asked me why I kept ducking as I walked in through the door. Don't get me wrong, Robert, he reassured me. I like it. It's cute. But why do you do it? I explained that I had to or I would knock my head on the top of the doorframe. 
Jeff and I stood under the entrance. The top of the door was a good six inches above my head. I had been on the set about three days before I realised it was about half as big again as the British set. It looked exactly the same, but it was bigger. This tends to be the rule across America. Everything is bigger, but you still behave as if you're in cramped old Europe and you duck your head. It was a metaphor for the whole experience for me. I was in a country where everything was bigger and different, but I still behaved the same. It was going to take me a long time to adapt. In the evenings after rehearsals, Hinton and I would generally go to the 24-hour gym which was just down the road, have a big workout and then go out to dinner and stuff our faces with high-fat food laced with colourings, flavourings and e-numbers. Delicious! Hinton was an amazing guy, born and bred on an army camp in Kansas. His father was a middle-ranking military man. Hinton didn't hear the word nigger or even know what it meant until he went to Washington when he was a teenager and his dad was posted there. He was called one by another black man on the street. We discussed the possibility of the series going ahead and what we would do. I'm happy to live on the coast, said Hinton. I've been in New York too long. I don't know if I'm happy about it or not, I said. Hey man, said Hinton, get in touch with your feelings. I tried to. I said, well, I don't like London that much, but it's a bit scary here. It feels like this is the filter where all the mad people get stuck. People get shot for bumping into another car at the traffic lights. Listen, Robert, we don't all have guns. I never had one. It's not that crazy here. I tried to believe him. I tried to feel at home in this weird world. Hinton told me how he had lived in New York for 20 years and the worst thing that ever happened to him was being hit by a speeding bicycle. I'll tell you what, though, Hinton, I said, having one of my ideas. I've always wanted to drive right across America. How about, if the series goes ahead, I meet you in New York, we buy some heap of shit big old car, and we drive across together. Whoa, said Hinton, laughing deeply in that special way only black men can. Okay, like, I know I said not everyone is crazy and carries a gun, but I meant, like, in New York, in L.A., if you and I drove into some towns in the Midwest, we'd be in deep shit. In one place, if I was driving, the police would think I'd kidnap you, so they'd shoot me. If the police didn't shoot me, some honky redneck would shoot you for being a nigger lover. Then, in another town, if you were driving, the police would think I was kidnapping you, so they'd shoot me again. If the police didn't shoot me, some honky redneck would shoot you for being a nigger lover. If we come back here, baby, we fly. No way am I driving through the crazy shit in the middle. On the Friday night of the first week, all the men from the cast went out for a meal together at a branch of the California Pizza Kitchen. We had designer pizzas all round. I had a smoked chicken, pine kernel and spinach pizza with Gruyere cheese and ham, sun-dried tomatoes, sliced dill cucumbers and mayonnaise on top. I think that's what it was. It didn't really look like a pizza. It looked like something you'd make for yourself late at night when you were stoned and had a terrible attack of the munchies. Within five minutes of meeting these men, I knew all about them, who they lived with, who they loved, who they hoped to love. They were incredibly open about their private lives incredibly quickly. There's ups and downs to this, of course. The negative side being the man who stands next to you in the queue for the plane, who will be telling you about how his mother was shot dead in Toledo, Ohio by a masked bank raider, how his wife left him for her lesbian psychoanalyst, how his child has stabbed his teacher in a dispute over pornography in the classroom, and all this before you hand in your boarding pass. On the other hand, you could say that the American attitude is normal and the English are a bunch of sad, repressed tossers who would rather be run over by a tractor than express a genuine emotion. I leave you to decide. On Saturday morning, I stood in the foyer of the hotel with Andrea and her boyfriend, Mickey. I had hired a car, and we were going out shopping. That's what a lot of Californians do in their leisure time. They display bumper stickers like Born to Shop on the backs of their cars. I am very bad at shopping, but I was prepared to give it a try. We had originally expected to go with Rob and Doug, who were desperate to get out and see Los Angeles, having never been there before. They had either been asleep in the hotel or on the set since the day we arrived. I knew things were not happy with the production, but I wasn't sure how unhappy. Rob and Doug were in the big black tower for the weekend, working with what sounded like 300 comedy scriptwriters. That sounds close enough to hell for me. For those of you not familiar with Universal Studios, the Big Black Tower is just that. At one end of the hundreds of white-roofed studios that make up the lot is a very tall black glass tower. This is where all the offices are. I never went in. I don't think actors are allowed anywhere near it. Suddenly, Andrea grabbed my arm and pointed out of the hotel doors. 
A huge black truck stroke station wagon stroke tank, which would make a Range Rover look like a toy, rumbled into the car park. I had hired this car through the studio. I said to the hire company that I wanted one of those jeepy things so you're sort of high up and can see over other cars. It was a Ford Bronco something or other, a monster, but a luxury monster. We sat in the car park for 10 minutes, playing with all the switches, whizzing the seats up and down, the roof open and closed, playing with the stereo that could burst your eardrums, the air conditioning which could freeze your genitals off. It was fantastic. We rumbled around town all day in this car, sitting up high just as I wanted to, but feeling slightly stupid to be going shopping in a car which could easily drive over a mountain range. In the afternoon, we visited a makeup superstore where Andrea was in heaven. Hundreds and thousands of jars of weird makeup, prosthetic remover, wigs, glue, false beards, all kinds of fake blood and eyeballs. One of the men who worked there had made the masks for Warren Beatty's film Dick Tracy. The workshop at the back of the store had an extraordinary collection of rubber bits and pieces used in films. This place seemed to supply everyone in Hollywood, including the foam which made Crichton's head. Come the second week of rehearsals, and it was clear that a lot of shit had hit a lot of fans while I'd been rumbling around in my monster jeep. Rob and Doug, we discovered, had been banned from the set for overstepping the mark. They were present as advisors to the producers, but they were naturally worried that the show was going to get screwed up. I assumed they had tried to influence things too much and had trodden on some frayed egos. The script had changed dramatically and not, I have to say, that much for the better. We spent another day eating donuts and Danish, drinking coffee and wandering through the scenes in a half-hearted sort of way. We had a long lunch break at one point. I later found out that this was because Rob and Doug had words with Linwood. I don't know what those words were exactly, but I don't think that they were the sort you'd go to a church to hear. Early the next morning, a script was slipped under the door of my hotel room. I opened it, read it quickly, and started laughing. It was funny, and I knew why. The comedy boot boys had got tooled up and were cruising the mean streets looking for trouble. They were attempting a coup, spreading propaganda amongst the masses. It was thrilling. I met up with Hinton in the foyer. This is good shit, he said, waving his copy of the script. Who did this? The comedy police, I said. Let's go and watch the shit come down. Chapter 12 As soon as we got to the studio, it was clear everyone else had received a script too. The mood was much better. I like this one, said Craig Bieko, holding the script aloft. This one is funny. The cast were asked to vote. Can you believe it? Vote on which script we preferred. It was a landslide for Rob and Doug. The comedy police had won the day. We'd been piddling about for about ten days. Then suddenly, with a virtually completely new script, we only had two days' rehearsal left. We worked hard all of a sudden, which is a bit of a shock, but the show came together remarkably quickly. I really enjoyed working with that cast and felt more and more happy about doing a whole series with them, even if I secretly hoped it would only be for one year. During the second day of rehearsal on the new script, Elvin came up to me and said very loudly, Robert Llewellyn, phone call. I found a phone hanging on a wall in a dark corner of the cavernous studio. I'd never seen it before. Hello? Hi, Dal, it's me in Ethiopia. You're not going to have plastic surgery, are you? Sorry? You're not going to have a facelift and have muscle implants in your legs, are you? I, I don't think so, Dal, I said. Why are you worried about it? Judy explained that a famous American actress had just flown in from Los Angeles and she looked a lot younger than she did in a TV series she'd made 20 years previously. Judy was worried that if we lived in Hollywood, I'd get all sucked in by this and have facelifts and hair transplants. I tried to assure her I wouldn't, that the people I was working with were really natural, and I was bonding with them. This worried her more. She didn't think I'd ever bonded with anyone before. She was convinced I'd been sucked into Hollywood. She asked me if I'd been jogging. I said I hadn't, but I was thinking about going. This really upset her, and she started crying. Elvin called me from across the studio. Robert Llewellyn, on set, please! It's very difficult to be supportive to your partner at a time like that. I couldn't imagine where she was, so far away and in such a strange place. Judy knew L.A. better than I did. She'd worked there a lot in the past as a circus performer and acrobat. I'd never been to Africa, let alone Ethiopia. My mind was a blank when I tried to imagine what she was going through. I said goodbye and rejoined the cast. I told them about my disturbing phone call and was showered with sympathy and support. 
I've never been accepted into such warm, embracing, bonding love so quickly anywhere on earth before. English actors can be a bit gushy or lovey, as I've said, but we don't have a patch on the American variety. The women were virtually weeping as I told them how much I missed Judy. The men embraced me, thanking me, telling me that knowing me, especially in my troubled time, was really important to them. I was touched. I was bonding, but mainly with the men. I didn't do any of the bonding with women that can get you into trouble with your long-term live-in regular partner. The women in the cast were great. I really liked them as sisters. Lorraine, who played Captain Tower, was a lovely woman. She hadn't had sex for a year. I didn't know what to say. Elizabeth Moorhead, who played Kachansky, had sex every night. I still didn't know what to say. Michael Heitzman, who played Officer Munson, could vaguely remember having sex in the 1970s, but he didn't think it was up to much. By this time in the rehearsals, we all seemed to know everything about each other. This is the upside to lovedom. I never felt lonely in Los Angeles, and I know from previous experience it can be a very lonely town. Just to balance out the whole California is full of natural people who relate to each other on a meaningful level notion, I need to relate the story of the Zeppelin invasion. The 25 women who came into the studio on the day before the pre-record were unbelievable. In the American pilot, there was a sequence where Lister showed Crichton a hologrammatic device which hides the fact that his bed is a total mess and contains an illicit cat. As any red dwarf aficionado will know, this is Frankenstein, the cat that is a distant ancestor to the cat we all know and love. The hologrammatic images Lister could use to cover his messy bed were his bed all neat and tidy just like Rimmer's, and another where a semi-naked beautiful blonde woman lay in a languorous pose on his bed. We arrived for rehearsal to find the studio full of women who had what seemed to be large, tightly stuffed pieces of IKEA furniture attached to their chests. I was completely dumbstruck. All the women auditioning for this part had undergone breast implant surgery of mind-boggling proportions. They wore super skin-tight bright yellow t-shirts, but they didn't look real. They looked like Barbie dolls. They all had big hair, which is a thing English women just don't seem to have. American women seem to be able to grow their hair bigger, huge piles of fluff, which is real, but doesn't look it. Interestingly enough, the woman who finally got the gig of lying on Lister's bed and having her picture taken was the only one present who didn't look like she had implants. Here I am spouting off about implants and I don't know the first thing about it. But all I do know is very few parts of the human anatomy have 90 degree angles in them unless there are bones present. That's how unrealistic these breasts were. Vertical down the chest, 90 degree angle forward, vague breast style shape, 90 degree down, then an aerobically super flat stomach. I asked the male members of the cast if they found a woman with massive pumped up breasts sexually attractive. They all denied that they did. I have since met all their girlfriends and I can state that they were being fairly honest. Not a silicon implant amongst them. I still don't really understand why these women did this to themselves. But then there's a lot of things that men do to themselves I don't understand. There's even a few things I do to myself. So there you go. Suddenly on the pre-record day it was like work again. I was up at the crack of dawn. Andrea and I were moaning and complaining. It was just like the good old days. On went the mask, and the new Crichton smiled right across his big square head. It was so comfortable. No rubber around my mouth or nostrils. There was no glue close to my eyes. The man who made the American mask is a god of prosthetics, a living legend of mechano-human comfort. With the mask on, and after receiving suitable fantastics and oh, and that is incredible from the director and cast, I headed for the costume department. The men who had covered me in plaster bandage and measured my every organ had come up trumps. A Crichton costume of splendid comfort, durability, flexibility and damn fine looks. I could sit in it, walk in it, turn in it. I could almost look sexy in it. I was a happy robot as I stomped onto the set. I marched up to Rob and Doug. I wanted them to see what I'd been on about all those years. This was just how I always wanted Crichton to be. Guys, I said, what do you think? Doug started to walk around me, staring at the wonderful detail and splendid cut of my chest piece, the snug fit of the lycra bodysuit, the gentle curves of the neck ribbing. Yeah, no, yeah, it's yeah, no, said Doug, nodding and raising his eyebrows. It looks pony, Bobby, said Rob after a while. I was heartbroken. Pony was the worst Rob Grant criticism. 
It was rhyming slang, pony and trap, crap. If Rob Grant said something looked pony, that was it. Oh, I think it looks great, I said in a pathetically defensive way. The costume's okay. The mask looks pony, said Rob. It's pony, Bobby. Yeah, no, yeah, pony, said Doug. Pony, Bobby, said Rob. Is it comfortable, though? asked Doug. It's never going to be comfortable, I whined, but it's bloody amazing in comparison with the old one. You look great, said Linwood, who joined us. Pony, said Rob, lighting another cigarette and walking away in disgust. The crew were great, about 300 more of them than they were in England, and they all earn a lot more money. They drive bigger cars, they eat more, they laugh more, their bottoms were considerably larger, but other than that, they were very similar. The director was calm and reassuring. Linwood was happy and loving and well-bonded and secure-looking. Rob and Doug, who were back on the set in a big way, were looking the same as ever, dishevelled, shagged out and totally focused on the job. During the early morning shoot, the cast gathered to make an entrance before a scene. I was asking about doing silly walks and voices as I normally do, just to pass the time. In a similar situation in the English series, Craig Charles would quite likely be setting fire to the set with his Zippo lighter just before we go on. Chris could very well be telling me about his straight 8 3.5 litre E-type Jaguar engine, introduced in the early 60s. Danny would be showing us some dance steps from the musical Les Miserables, or doing a drag run and laughing very loudly. Someone shouts action and we go on. Not so with the American cast. As I did a comedy walk up the corridor and tried to copulate with part of the set, Craig and Chris asked me if I wouldn't mind stopping. I'm sorry, Robert, but I, I really have to focus a moment here, said Chris. Would you please stop fucking the sliding door? Oh, sorry, sorry, I said. I felt awful. I would hate to be thrown by another actor in a situation like that. I was so used to the atmosphere in the old Red Dwarf, I completely lost my manners. We finished at something like six in the evening. Andrea cleaned off the mask and I showered in my dressing room, receiving the standard amount of static electric shocks. Los Angeles is basically built on a desert. And I suppose it's something to do with the air and the temperature and the nylon carpet. But everything I touched sent such a bolt of static through me, my hair stood on end. I met up with Hinton and we went out to the movies in my big rumbling jeep. I admit now that I saw Free Jack. It's a movie with Mick Jagger in it. It is quite an embarrassing thing to have to admit that you paid money to go and see a film like Free Jack. Mick Jagger. What an actor. What I do remember clearly, though, was the cinema was in an area I wasn't familiar with. I only noticed as I bought the tickets and joined Hinton, who had purchased a large bucket of popcorn. I was more or less the only white person there. There was no clear sign of hostility, but I definitely sensed some underlying tension. After the movie, I asked Hinton if he noticed or if it was just me being paranoid. He told me about the Rodney King trial, and I remembered seeing the video of the four policemen beating up the black guy at night. It was shown every night on the TV as the newsman said, The Rodney King trial continues today. Defence claimed that Rodney King was a drunken, drug-running, cop-killing bum. More on that later. Plus, how Kim Basinger didn't get an invite to the big party. But now, sport. This was all new for me. I'd always been in environments where black people were in a minority and suffering from white racism. Driving through the wide, quiet streets of South Central LA that night with Hinton was a peaceful and relaxing thing to do. The footage I watched later on TV, where I recognised many locations, was all the more chilling. It was obviously going to happen. The authorities knew it was going to happen. Basically, my favourite conspiracy theory about the LA riots of the early 90s, which I heard from many different people, was that they were positively encouraged by the city and state authorities. They let the problem burn itself out. Most of the people who were killed were black gang members and the city didn't care about them. It only started to concern the authorities when places like the Beverly Center shopping mall was set on fire. The following day in the studio, racial harmony blossomed. Elvin Ivory turned up driving his Thursday Porsche, a green one. He explained to me that he has a Porsche for each day of the week, each one of them especially adapted to take his amazing 6 foot 7 inch frame. Good morning, Robert Llewellyn, he said with a big grin as he strode past me. We all gathered together and had a script meeting, yet more changes, but none very major, and then we camera blocked the show that was going to be recorded in front of an audience that evening. They recorded two versions of the show that day. 
one in the afternoon without an audience, one in the evening with an amazingly big and noisy audience. I had to put my makeup on during the lunch break, ready for the full recorded dress run in the afternoon. The recording went very well. We all knew what we were doing and we did it well. During the break between recordings, I had a lie down in my big dressing room. I pondered on the possibility of doing this every week for 36 weeks. I allowed myself to muse on what I would do with the cornucopia of cash which was clearly heading my way. A little bungalow in the Hollywood Hills. A Ford Mustang convertible in the garage. Judy coming back from yoga class. Our two small and obviously immaculately well-behaved children sitting eating their organic dippy eggs at the sun-kissed kitchen table. I got up. It was all a bit too much. I looked out of the window of my dressing room. There wasn't much to look at, just the roof of a car parked right outside. It was a white Rolls Royce. I don't know whose it was. Maybe it was for me. Maybe they just forgot to tell me about it. Maybe it's still there waiting for me to pick up. I entered the studio with the rest of the cast and we hid behind the set. The atmosphere was transformed. There was an audience of about 500 people, most of whom had already seen the British series. We were introduced one by one, and I have to say, and it's not often this happens, and I'm normally very humble and I never hungered for stardom, but I have to say that the crowd went apeshit when I walked onto the set. Crichton has never received such a welcome from such an enormous audience. I admit it was rather pleasant. During that evening, I can safely say it was one of the top two or three Red Dwarf recordings I have ever been involved in from an audience response point of view. They absolutely loved it. They laughed at everything and they roared laughing at Crichton. I had never enjoyed making an episode of Red Dwarf more. I wasn't hot, I wasn't too uncomfortable, and I had loads of gags and no big speeches explaining triplicators and time dilation. When the audience had finally cleared the room, the men in suits from NBC television the broadcasters who were due to pay for the series and the men in suits from Universal Television who were due to make the series all came up to meet me. I've never shaken so many hands in one evening in costume. People literally queued up to have their pictures taken with me. At one point I stood next to a very rich man in a very expensive suit and pulled a face into a camera. He shook my hand and said, you are going to be a major star here, Robert. Fantastic performance. I don't know who he was, but he looked to be at the very top of his game. You cannot be that confident, have that many people waiting on you and listening to your every utterance if you're just the kid who works in the mail room. I thanked him and saw Rob and Doug looking at me. Bobby, said Rob as he hugged me. Well done, Mum. We've done it. Fantastic. Doug gave me a big hug. Yeah, 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 Bobby, great, yeah, he said. Hey, are you the popular one tonight, or what? Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it, I said, grateful to talk to people I actually knew. They're all going crazy about you, Bobby, said Rob. They must be fucking delusional. He grinned and gave me another hug. Elvin Ivory walked up and embraced me. My head came up to his tummy button. Robert Llewellyn, you were great. That was a really funny performance. Listen, the boss of NBC was in tonight. He loved it. I'm telling you, I've been in this business a long time. I'm telling you, this show is going to run. I'm telling you, Robert Llewellyn, you are going to be a star. I thanked him. I thanked everyone. I was very well brought up. I'm polite. Andrea came up to me and told me I had been clear for 15 or 20 minutes. And how come I hadn't run screaming into my dressing room to get the makeup off? She couldn't believe what was going on. The whole studio was full of people embracing each other, patting each other on the back. Elvin was passing around peak caps with I rode the red dwarf embossed on the front. Champagne bottles popped. Linwood gave me a plastic cupful. Robert, what can I say? He said. You were really amazing. I can't tell you how proud I am to have worked with you. This show is going to run. You know, I can feel it, man. And you were so good. So funny. You worked so damn hard. It's incredible, man. Did you hear the audience? They loved it, man. Hey, listen. Are you pleased I talked you into it? I told him I was very pleased. I drank my champagne and hugged the cast. We all kept hugging and kissing and drinking champagne for what seemed like ages. I eventually stumbled somewhat groggily back to my dressing room with Andrea. She peeled the mask off very quickly, and while she was busy, there was a constant flow of people coming into the room. The cast, the director, Rob and Doug, Linwood. 
I was sitting in my Calvin Klein briefs with a shredded rubber head on, looking like E.T. after a car wreck. No one minded. It was party time. We all retired to the lobby of the hotel. Waiters brought more and more champagne. Linwood and Robin Doug seemed to have made up. Jeff Field was inviting me over to his house to ride some of his polo ponies. He came to England regularly to play polo. He'd even played against Prince Charles. I don't know much about polo, but I know it's not a cheap sport to take up. I learned that Jeff had been directing a series called Night Court for many years. He was a seriously rich individual, and he had that seriously rich way of sitting and talking. Getting to bed that night took me ages. There were so many people to say goodbye to, so many addresses and phone numbers to swap, so many people to promise to keep in touch with. It took me about an hour to work my way towards the lift in the hotel lobby, but I was seriously knackered. I collapsed with exhaustion at about three in the morning and felt sorry for Rob and Doug, who had to get up at eight and fly back to London to complete the edit on series five. I was woken at nine the following morning when my phone rang. The man at reception told me I had a call from Herb Greenstein. I hadn't got a clue who he was talking about, but Herb Greenstein was put through. Hi, Robert, this is Herb Greenstein. I saw you last night in the Red Dwarf Pilot. You were fantastic. I'm just ringing, no strings attached, really informally, to see if you have representation here. He was an agent, and he was after my ass. Um, I, I, I've got an agent in London, I said, trying to speak through the dead vermin on my tongue. Being a very light drinker, I only have to sniff alcohol, and I have the mother of hangovers the following morning. Sure, but you need someone to look out for you over here. Why don't we meet up for lunch and talk it over in a completely informal, no-strings-attached way? Let's go to Musso and Frank's. No sooner had I scribbled down some information about when and where I'd meet this herb guy, the phone rang again. Hi, Robert. I was given your number by Mona. My name's Richard Williams. I saw you last night in the Red Dwarf Potter, and I thought you were fantastic. After the third call, I asked reception to take messages and let me sleep. But it was no good. My mind was racing with what was happening to me. As I was in the shower, I realised that I was potentially very hot property for an agent in Los Angeles. I was an actor out on a limb with a ready-made income. They didn't have to do anything except increase that income, rake off their 10% and go out to lunch with me occasionally. When I got down to reception, there were eight messages and five faxes waiting for me. I felt like a very important person all of a sudden. I needed to spend some time on my own to remind myself that I wasn't important at all. I'm old enough to know that I only feel important and special if people tell me I am. As soon as I'm alone, I remember the brutal truth. I threw my small bag into the vast cavern of my rumbling jeep and drove down the road ten miles or so to my favourite diner. It was crowded and busy and no one recognised me or told me I was great. I had a huge gut-busting breakfast with ten cups of coffee. I read all my faxes and messages, many of which were from London. My solo show, The Reconstructed Heart, was receiving a lot of attention, and it was clear I had to get back there to promote it. I'd written articles for The Guardian, The Times, even The Daily Mail. I filled in questionnaires from City Limits magazine, Time Out. I did an interview with GQ. However much I tried to remember that I wasn't important, and things were really just normal, I was being swept along with the thought that I was going to be rich and famous and live in America. I handed the parking attendant my ticket outside the diner, and he delivered my huge rumbler to the curb. I gave him a $10 tip. Yeah, big spender. And then I drove over the hill into Hollywood. I had a lunch appointment at Musso and Frank's, an old-fashioned restaurant on Hollywood Boulevard. I was meeting Herb Greenstein, the agent who'd woken me up. Robert, said Herb, it's great to meet you. Herb was waiting for me at a table near the door. We then both moved to a small, dimly lit cubicle at the back. What do you want? said a very old, tight-skinned waiter. I'm not sure if the waiters at Musso and Frank's have a reputation for being very rude, but if they don't, I'm starting one. They are very rude. They're also very funny. We'll have water and a menu already, said Herb Greenstein, not phased at all. He turned back to me eagerly. This is great, Robert. You are such a talented actor. You are a star in England, right? Well, no, to be honest, I don't think I could claim that. 
Stop being so modest already. If you're not, it's their loss. Because you are going to be massive here. The white Eddie Murphy. That's what I'm calling you. You are so funny with your walks and all your voices. Seriously, I'm telling you. You have a natural talent for physical comedy. You're the funniest guy to hit this crazy town since Buster Keaton. Well, I hardly think... Herb leaned very close to me. He glanced around and then said conspiratorially, You will make so much money here with that kind of talent. Well, I don't know. I mean, it was only a pilot. But what a pilot! Oi, oi, it'll run, believe me. Tell me, what are you making on the show? I wasn't sure what to say. I still felt the natural British reticence when it came to talking about money. I, I didn't want to tell this man how much I was paid. He started throwing around ludicrous ballpark figures. I eventually nodded when he came down as low as mine. Oi, what are you doing, charity work? He said happily. You know what Ted Danson gets? I told him I knew it was a million pounds an episode. That's for one transmission. He gets 80% for a repeat, Robert. I can guarantee that for the first year, I will get you between one hundred sixty to $170,000 an episode. Okay, so this year, it's a six-episode mid-season replacement, so you're looking at close to $1 million. That's just a start. Then next year, 36 episodes, we go in general, 200000 ep, raising to two hundred fifty in summer. Now you're looking at about $8.5 million a year. He paused and stared into my eyes, presumably looking for signs of delight. He could clearly sense my misgivings. Pre-tax, of course, I'm talking gross, but even after every deduction there is, you're walking away with six million bucks in your pocket. It's big money, Robert, and you just fell right in it. How did you do it? I'll tell you, with talent. That's what sells in this crazy town. After lunch, I left Herb Greenstein on the pavement, waving at me furiously as I gunned my rumbler back over the hill. I was being very well looked after for the remainder of my stay in Los Angeles. Lovely Jane Leaves had offered me the spare room in her apartment in Studio City. I want to clarify now that nothing of a romantic or explicit nature happened between myself and Jane. She was a lovely and generous host. Yes, I noticed she was very gorgeous, but nothing ever happened. I then went with Jane to see her agent, who also told me I was the greatest thing since sliced bread, but at least he was a little more legitimate sounding. He worked in a big black tower on Sunset Boulevard in a company called CAA. This was a huge agency that looked after thousands of actors, some of them really famous. So you want to live in L.A.? he said cheerfully. Um, not really, I said, but uh, I will if I have to. You have to, Robert, because that show is going to run. Right, I said. If you ever want to talk about representation, you know where I am. Give me a call. I guess you've been chased a bit, huh? I nodded. Don't worry about it. You'll do good. You are hot property now, Robert. This always happens when there's a new talent in town. This town is talent hungry and you have got buckets to sell. On the way out to a restaurant that evening, Jane told me her agent never bullshitted. He was a straight down the line guy. We met up with the rest of the cast in some really shishy place, the name and location of which I truly can't remember, but the food was brilliant. The waiters were dead trendy and it cost a fortune. I was getting more and more calls from London. It was clear I had to get back. The following day, I caught a plane to New York. First class, American Airlines. All paid for, by the way. The food wasn't quite as good as Qantas, but there was plenty of it and masses of room. New York was snowbound and bitterly cold. I stayed with old friends for two nights in their lovely old house in upstate New York. I spent a day with Chris Eigman in Manhattan. We saw Boris Yeltsin arrive by helicopter at the Battery. By chance, that is. I hadn't arranged it with Boris. In the evening, I had a great meal at La Indochine restaurant with Chris. This is the place where drop-dead beautiful people queue to get a job as wait persons because they're supposed to get spotted for movie parts. They were all drop-dead beautiful, but I didn't think any of them were going to get a gig, to be honest. I stayed at Chris's house that night, and he woke me at the crack of doom the following morning with a cup of English tea. He had very kindly booked me a taxi to get me to the airport. The man driving the taxi was a Serb. He hated America. He wanted to go back to his own country, but he couldn't afford it. I felt lucky and gave him a big tip. As he drove away, it struck me that he might be from Brooklyn and love America. He might just hate wishy-washy British liberals. I flew back to London first class. Ah, it was so luxurious and proper, so rich feeling and special making. I got on the tube at Heathrow and headed for my small flat in Islington. The specialness and richness and glamour started to feel like old party clothes. 
I was back to normal, back to London. My push bike, the rain, the homeless people, the telephone bills, the dust, the shopping that needed doing. Judy was still in Ethiopia. There was no one at my flat. It was warm, but hollow. There was a very big pile of mail for me. None of the letters were from Hollywood. There was no contract. There was no demand for me to get on the next flight out there and start shooting the series. Likewise, my answer machine, many messages, none from Universal Television, none from some agent saying, Bob, they want you to take Mel Gibson's part in Lethal Weapon 7. You're going to have to wear a wig so it looks like you got a mullet. Nothing. I made a cup of English tea and sat in silence. Back to normal. It was all right, really. I wasn't sad. I was just waiting to calm down again. The irony light in the giant control room in the sky had been going on my section for a long time. However, every now and then, when there is some heavy irony going down somewhere else on Earth, you get a break. There was no irony going through my mainframe as I sat in my kitchen. I was in an irony-free zone. It was only a temporary glitch, but while it lasted, it was very, very peaceful. Epilogue Universal Television presented NBC with a pilot episode of Red Dwarf USA later that year. It has its faults, but for a pilot, I'd say it was pretty damn good. Linwood Boomer was fired, as was Chris Eigman and Hinton Battle. They fire people all the time in Hollywood. Apparently, it's nothing to be alarmed about. They recast both parts with the cat played by a woman. They never reshot the pilot, but they did shoot a short trailer for it, which I wasn't involved in. Rob and Doug went back to Los Angeles for about six weeks trying to hustle up support for the project. By mid-June that year, Doug rang me to say NBC had decided to drop the whole thing. The Fox network picked it up, but nothing ever happened. All the agents who blessed my head with praise have singularly failed to keep in touch. The only thing I've learned through all of this is in show business, don't believe it until it's happening. And even then, stay sceptical. <laughs>